I think the role of the NAP4 report was to gather data that we previously didn't know. So we were able to gather data from a whole year's worth of anaesthetic activity across a whole country. Um, so that was its role, which it fulfilled very well. The significance is that we found uh, instances and events that we suspected may be happening, but we really didn't know. So now we've got some hard data on which to try and develop our practice. I think the major findings of the report with regard to supraglottic airway devices is that we need to be taught to use them properly, to insert them correctly in patients where it's appropriate to do so, to recognise their limitations, um, and particularly when the limitations are to do with patient characteristics, to choose an appropriate device. So more second generation devices when we're going to be ventilating patients, patients who are, have a high BMI or whether a lithotomy or head down. The key things about second generation supraglottic airway devices would be that we should be using them when it's appropriate to do so. So patients where there's tracheal tube isn't indicated but there's some small risk of aspiration, then a second generation device is a more logical choice than a first one. Or if devices are going to be used at the limits of their capabilities. So if we're ventilating patients, or if the patient's a lithotomy, or head down, or we've got a high BMI, then the second generation devices are a more logical choice than a first. The first generation devices were the ones that came out first, and it's just what we consider to be an ordinary laryngeal mask. The second generation devices have an esophageal drain tube, with a port that sits over the top of the esophagus that can vent uh, gas and fluid. They have improved uh, cuff seal pressures, so they have different cuffs, and that gives better functional separation of the respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts. And finally, they have an integral bite block, so that if during emergence from anaesthesia the patient bites down on the device, the airway remains patent. So they're the key three differences between the first and second generation devices. We have to remember that the NAP4 wasn't a prospective study, it wasn't comparing the, the performance of different devices. And really all we're aware of is the, the amount of other work that's been done looking at this. And it's important when considering second generation devices that you have got functional separation of respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts. So that requires a primary seal around your larynx and your airway and a secondary seal at the top of the esophagus. So those two seals are important, but it's important that the, the two channels are kept separate. This is from research that's outside of NAP4, but if you're ventilating patients, certainly I think then a second generation device would be a default device. And from the things that we found in NAP4, then yeah, anything where the, a first generation device would be at the limits of its performance. So the obese patient, head down, lithotomy, unusual positions. Um, then it makes much more sense to be choosing a second generation device for those cases. Well obviously with all of the panel members we hope it will influence practice a great deal. We've already seen changes uh, put into place in terms of national guidance for some of the uh, recommendations that we've made and across the country individual uh, anaesthetists are doing presentations locally looking at the recommendations and, and making changes in their own departments and their own practice. The only way we'll really know what the extent of the changes are would be if we were to repeat a similar project in the future but that's a long way off. <laughs>
as clinicians, we need to work with industry looking at the, the best design of products that we can so that the products that we get will work really well for us. Um, the companies can also help with dissemination of information from the MAP4 report. Uh, but particularly I see a sort of a combined role working with ongoing education and supporting workshops so that clinicians know about the devices and know, that, know how to use them properly and can practice using them in a safe environment.